Good afternoon, Cincinnati Rotarians. It's great to be with you. Doug Bolton, honored to be your president. You know, life is very fragile. Uh, we see that every single day in our news, in our lives. Uh, we want to today especially pray for Dr. Charles Pierce, who's in the hospital, not doing well. Um, he is at UC Westchester, room 129. And also keep our member and board member, Ed Mathis, in your prayer, recently having uh, the death of two family members um, just last night. So um, please keep these people and their families in your prayers. You know, as a, uh, a son of a Navy veteran, I've been looking t forward to today's program so much. And beginning our program, we are happy to have uh, a volunteer member of the USS Foundation, Noah Demerly, leading our national anthem. Now as I call your name, if you would, 
with Pete Stan, so that we might recognize you. From U.S. Bank, the guest Brian Bowman, Stephen Baker. <laughs> guest of Steve Drayball from the Easter Seal, Sherry Evans. <laughs> and for the uh, economic director of the city of Springdale, David McCandless. We have quite a few, uh, oh, excuse me, one more. Uh, past District Governor Leonor, uh, Leon Hirsch from Pensacola, Florida, District 6940. Quite a few members of the USS Cincinnati Foundation. So I'm just going to ask all of you to stand at once as I call your name Charlene Brokaw, Jim Brokaw, Noah Demerke, George Stringer, Barry Quinton, and Heather Quinton. Welcome to the <laughs> All right, our meeting sponsor today, Patrick Over. Patrick, come on up. Hello, everyone. I'm Patrick Over, Director of Programs and Operations at Stepping Stones. Some of you may have heard of <laughs> For those of you that haven't, let me introduce Stepping Stones to you and tell you about the programs that we provide to individuals disabilities across the Cincinnati and Ohio region. Founded in 1963, Stepping Stones is a nonprofit organization that proudly serves Greater Cincinnati. We offer a variety of educational and recreation programs for individuals with disabilities at four locations, including sites in Batavia, Indian Hill, Norwood, and Western Hills. Our programs support children, teens, and adults on the pathway to independence and empower them to more fully participate in their community. In 1963, Stepping Stones pioneered camping programs for children and adults with disabilities who had few or no alternatives by founding the region's first summer program for individuals with disabilities. Today, that program continues and serves individuals from more than 20 Ohio counties through our nine-week summer day camp and Saturday Kids and Young Adults Clubs that's located at our Giving Road campus, campus in Indian Hill, and at our overnight staycations and weekend respite programs at our Camp Allen location in Batavia. Our Step Up program, which began in 2004, serves students on the autism spectrum who have exhausted options in traditional school settings at our Giving campus in Indian Hill. This unique program partners with multiple Greater Cincinnati public school districts to provide an alternative education program for students who have been unable to succeed in typical settings. Our students receive the tools they need to successfully navigate academic studies, learn self-regulation skills, develop vocational skills through authentic experiences to enable them to transition to adulthood and more fully participate in their community. Finally, our adult day services programs welcome participants upon completion of high school through age 65 plus, if we've got a couple individuals in their 80s at our programs right now, uh, runs weekdays throughout the year, Monday through Friday. In adult day services, participants find pathways to independence, build confidence through socialization and interpersonal relationships, explore their community on daily outings, and develop independent living skills. Our adult day program serves individuals across Cincinnati at locations in Western Hills, Norwood, and Batavia. Stepping Stones is a longtime partner of the Cincinnati Rotary Club. We are proud to serve individuals with disabilities across Cincinnati and Ohio on their path towards greater independence. We are grateful for all the Rotarians that volunteer out at Camp Allen, and we look forward to seeing some of you at our Norwood location for the Rotary Union. Patrick, uh, just using that as a good segue to talk about due days, we are still in need of about 150 volunteers 
for our events on October 26, 27, and 28. If you have already signed up for a project on either Thursday, Friday, or Saturday, consider signing up for another day uh, in order to help us fill those remaining slots. And then, of course, please welcome your family, friends, neighbors. Uh, you know where the link is. Um, I'm confident we'll get to 600 volunteers serving 40 nonprofits, including our, our very valued Stepping Stones neighbors. Um, will you give all of yourselves a big round of applause? This is a huge undertaking, and you guys have nailed it. We obviously want to have all of our new members engaged, and so introducing one of our newest members is Stephanie Shear. Stephanie? And just a funny story, how she and I connected was um, kind, of, kind of a little bit different. We met actually on social media. Um, so the power of uh, social media influence is a real thing. Um, she and I both have got businesses online and we connected, started following each other on Instagram. And I had been sharing uh, different Rotary events and meetings that I was attending and she slipped into my DMs and she's like, hey, uh, what about Rotary? I would love to attend. I said, that would be great. And now here she is. So the rest is history. It's pretty awesome. so I'm going to share a little bit about Emily. Um, she is the founder and owner of Thriviest, which is a nutrition and counseling one-on-one -on -one company. Um, it's a coaching service where she specializes in weight loss for women. Um, she has a passion for teaching how-tos when it comes to um, getting healthy and staying healthy. Teaching women how to create healthier habits and eat for their life, not for a diet life. For long-term weight loss success. Emily, she earned her Master of Science degree from Cornell University, and she is a certified nutrition and wellness coach and works with women literally all over the world. She is married to her husband, Steve. They've been married for 35 years, and they have two sons. She and her husband live in Loveland. She also, this is pretty amazing, she serves as um, the lead nutritionist with partners for medical relief in Belize, and she usually does it about three times a year. Um, I just think that's phenomenal. It's just really cool. And she also um, works with City Gospel Mission and helps plan the Christmas Day menu as well as help decorate for that. She is an early riser, and I know this because I obviously I told her, told you I follow her on Instagram, and she gets up about 4:30 every morning to do client calls with folks that are, you know, like international. And I see her post her stories where she's got a cup of coffee on the treadmill, and I get up at 5:30, so I'm not like that late. But she's got me being picked up, so it's pretty amazing. Um, just a few other things: she is an avid reader. She loves to travel and enjoys cooking. And we are so excited to have her as part of our Rotary Club. So if you guys will give her a wonderful, warm Rotary welcome, that would be great. Welcome, Emily. We are so glad to have you. And um, sounds like a great professional development topic uh, for Rotarians in the future. And speaking of professional development topics, our own Bill Stilley is going to be leading a time management 101 professional development seminar on November 2nd. Uh, that's a, at 11 o'clock before our meeting. Make sure that you register uh, for that event by October 27th. So do some own uh, time management to, uh, to get registered for that event. All right, Mike LaValle, will you stand? Mary Dornetti, will you stand? And Bob McElroy, will you stand, please? Mary, and where's Bob? All right, on three, will everybody say happy birthday with me? One, two, three. Happy birthday! Awesome. Um, we want to remind you about the uh, Friday the 13th, tomorrow is Rotary After Hours from 6 to 9 p.m. at Janet Metzler's house. You can RSVP and DACDB. 
And then don't forget about next week's Neighborhood Coffee on Tuesday, October 17th from 8 to 10 a.m. at Urbana Coffee on Broadway to discover how Rotarians are advancing environmental sustainability globally and here in Cincinnati. Feel free to bring a member, a guest, um, invite some member who doesn't come to our regular Thursday meetings because they can't come and uh, get them engaged. Uh, RSVPs are asked for, but they're not required. So if you wake up Tuesday morning or thinking about it Monday night, um, please feel free to join us. We had a phenomenal fundraiser um, last week uh, for the World Affairs Committee, and it is still collecting donations for Solarize Uganda Now. Uh, donations uh, are being matched up to $50,000, so every dollar that you contribute really helps us get to our goal, and envelopes are available at the check-in, um, or see Deborah Schultz, I'm sure she'll be happy to, to uh, take your credit card if you'd like. <laughs> All right. Um, oh, come on, Deborah, you can, you can do, you can, you can do that. All right. I feel like I flew through the announcements. Sarah, did I forget anything? I think I got everything. Okay. Awesome. So now we get to hear about our program, and uh, I was, I was with. I know, I know, I know. Split the pie. I, I was with some uh, some Rotarian presidents of other clubs. Uh, some of you may know that we were gathering, um, <clears throat> excuse me, other presidents of Greater Cincinnati's Rotary Clubs are gathering every Wednesday evening at the Metropolitan Club just to, to compare stories. And um, and we were talking, and, and obviously uh, every every Rotary Rotary Club in America is jealous of our programming. So out conscious does a phenomenal job, but he has a committee of people, including Steve Drayful, that just rock our programs, and um, really, really excited about this program. But before we do that, let's figure out who won Split the Pot. <laughs> Ticket number is four seven one nine seven two. What color is it though? It's orange. It's a good thing I'm not colorblind, right? Four seven one nine seven two. Uh, we didn't have to go far. So Bill, Bill is the winner of forty five dollars. And uh, Christy, what's the running pot up to now? Eight eight hundred and something. Does anybody remember? Oh, and what's the running pot up to now? $849. Can you pull the Queen of Arts? Oh, so close. <laughs> All right, Steve, let's get our program started. Financial stresses and the difficulties 
jobs and pursuing education. We work with Cincinnati area communities, civic and business leaders, to build and sustain a sense of community pride in our group and foster positive relationships between the Queen City and her namesake ship. And we invite everyone to help show the ship's crew in Cincinnati is proud of their service and will continue to support them. Our ship, our city.
this is a really special and unique relationship that we have. I, uh, throughout the week, I've been bragging with some of my colleagues about the relationship that we have and the experiences that we're having this week. And I'll tell you that it's not common, uh, so thank you so much for the support. Thank you for supporting them, and thank you for supporting us, and as, as we like to say, our ship. <coughs> so I would like to take a few minutes of the time here today for sure to concentrate on what our ship does, and uh, then I'll open it up for any questions. I, I will offer that I'll probably only speak about areas of the Navy that I'm more familiar with. If you listen to the, the introduction here, I have spent a good <coughs> chunk of my time at sea uh, on ships, so that's mostly what I'm, I'm uh, familiar with able to give you more detailed answers about, but I'll happy to try. And if it's something that one of the members of my crew can potentially give you a little bit more detail about, I'm happy to have them speak as well. So if you have any questions about their service or some of their experiences, they're happy to share that as well. So looking at why do we have a Navy, uh, we spend a lot of money. If you, if you see all the Navy-related articles that I do, you know that ships cost a lot of money. The budget for the Navy seems massive. So what are we getting out of this? Well, we are a maritime nation. We straddle two huge oceans. 90% of global commerce still goes and travels by sea. 95% of data travels through undersea cables. So this is incredibly relevant. What you see on the screen here are the sea lines of communication. And just as we learned uh, in very recent history, we had a ship that ran aground into the Suez, and we saw the supply chain issues in the backup that that single event caused or during COVID when we couldn't get folks into ports in order to load and unload our ships efficiently, we saw the impact that that had. And one of the missions that, that we talk about with our ship is designated as a mine worker mission package ship. Uh, sea mines, I'll talk a little bit about, they can have a very similar impact to those with, in, at a very cheap cost to those who want to cause that effect. A couple more statistics here. Talk through uh, introductions, so I won't go through those again. So the objectives for today, I want to emphasize the importance of the Navy. I want to share our experiences with our city, and I want to do the best to answer any questions that you might have about the Navy. <coughs> so our ship, USS Cincinnati, we were commissioned in 2019. You saw the video playing out in the lobby as you walked by from that ceremony. They did look, I've learned during this trip, that they looked at getting the ship into uh, Cincinnati. The air draft on some of the bridges would not be conducive to that. Uh, so <laughs> in other ways, I will talk about our ship is uniquely uh, geared towards operating in some of the environments around us. We arrived at our home port in San Diego after traveling around through the Panama Canal and doing several port visits en route to uh, San Diego, where we are still home ported today. In October of 2020, we were designated as a training ship, and I'll talk about what the significance of that is as well. We supported 10 different deploying crews and six different ships that have deployed, as well as uh, additional support to many others. While we're uh, mostly uh, operating in a training role, as I mentioned, we also conduct a uh, third fleet tasking, which is the fleet commander that's on the West Coast. So we operate in the, uh, the Pacific, nearby the mainland here for most of our operations. And uh, while we're doing that, uh, we're kind of the workhorse and the local fleet commander, so when they need a ship to conduct an exercise, we uh, pair up with partners that might be out of area deploying out to us. We did a fleet week event earlier this year in Los Angeles, and uh, we also do escort duties when we have a high value uh, unit ship that might need some support, we'll conduct an escort of them to ensure safety of their operations. Very recently, this last year, we were the ship that tested the next generation mine warfare mission package. And uh, if you've ever done military testing, a lot of it from the ship perspective, it looks like pushing a button. Well, I'll tell you, this was much more complex. Uh, and that goes back to the deck chief and the work that they did. We're talking about using cranes in a the manner that they were not originally designed for to lift 25,000 pound unmanned surface vessels and extend them out the back of the ship, launch them, and then control them while sometimes moving at high speed with uh, looking through a straw-sized camera in uh, shallow water environments with a lot of other traffic around. So this was quite a challenging test. Uh, I did ballistic missile defense testing when I was a uh, junior officer, and I'll tell you, it really did amount to, yeah, the, the engineers come on board, they install a bunch of stuff, make sure everything op tests, you hit a couple buttons, the missile goes boom, and it's the big success. What we did with Cincinnati was a lot more involved and took a lot of dedication 
And uh, it was a grueling effort. And uh, we, we've accomplished with that what took years and years to try to finally develop. And now we're on pace to uh, have this new capability introduced to the fleet and start to retire some of the wooden chips that Old Chief and I have served on that used to do the mission. And then most recently, we've uh, restructured our command and control and we fall underneath uh, the Expeditionary Strike Group. So we've been partnering a lot more with the Marine Corps. During my last underway, uh, we had two Marine Corps aircraft, uh, Huey and a Cobra. They came on board, we replenished them at the same time. I'll show you our flight deck is, is pretty large and we're able to operate with multiple aircraft simultaneously. We armed their joint air ground missile and then they successfully conducted a sea strike uh, off of our ship uh, through our command and control. So that is a thing that's going to push out the capabilities of the Marine Corps and be able to uh, significantly contribute to contingencies that we can imagine that might happen in the, the, the Western Pacific. I heard that's $100. <laughs> Unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, we like I said, we have been a workhorse. We put a lot of a lot of wear and tear on the ship. We're due for some maintenance and upkeep. So early next year, we are scheduled to uh, have a significant uh, amount of maintenance, probably for the first six, seven months of the year. So why do we have a training ship? We have some Navy veterans in here. I'm sure many others have experienced the Navy deployment. Uh, those go roughly about six to ten months. The longest I've ever done is just about ten months on a destroyer. With the LCS program, we recently had a ship from our division come back from a 27-month deployment. So what enables that increased operational availability is the blue gold concept and the blue gold rotations. But while we have two crews, a blue crew and a gold crew, they can't both be on their ship at the same time. The littoral combat ship, specifically the independence variant littoral combat ship that we're talking about, we have limited berthing, so both crews cannot operate on the ship at the same time, even if we wanted to try. So they'll come on board and embark uh, our ship as the training ship, and they'll conduct their pre-deployment training, their workups, and also sometimes their sustainment events when they're in between those legs of deployment. So that is why we have a training ship and, and uh, how we contribute to that process. Now our, our crew and our ship won't always be a training ship. Um, our crew right now, uh, there, there was actually a rumor We'll see how it plays out, where we could rotate to another ship due to the maintenance period. They want to make sure that there is a training ship designated in that role, and we're still working through the, the different options that we have to make sure that we can maintain our training requirements. But there, there most likely will become a time where the crew will go to another ship, and Cincinnati goes into the deployment rotation in the next several years. Or there's also discussion of going to a single crewing model for LCS, at which time Cincinnati will just become a, a deploying ship into a normal. Uh, cycle where ships typically go through, you start in like a maintenance phase, you finish that, you go through basic phase training, you go into your integrated and advanced training, you're in a little bit of period of sustainment where you can search for a deployment on a short notice, you go through your deployment cycle, you come back, you're in a sustainment again where you could be researched for deployment and then start the maintenance over again. So that's a normal kind of life cycle of a ship and we could end up in that cycle in the next several years. <coughs> By the way, I don't, uh, I don't know if we normally wait to the end for questions, but I'm happy to take them any time if, if uh, anything I'm covering is not clear or not, and then definitely save some time at the end. So our ship, here's a couple of articles, as I've talked about. Mine warfare, traditionally what it's been is you try to keep the probability of causing a sea mine to detonate to the bare minimum that you can through masking your acoustic signature, your magnetic signature, and uh, taking measures on board the ship to increase your survivability to the maximum that you can. And then you take the ship into the minefield. So you're operating with a sonar or with sweep gear in the minefield and trying to neutralize mines or sweep for the mines. With the littoral combat ship mission package, the idea is to keep the sailor out of the minefield. So the equipment that we were testing for this, <laughs> These are some of our robots, and the pictures I know are, are a little bit collage, so please ask questions. But what you're seeing in the upper left picture, that is the mission bay. So inside of the, uh, the mission bay, which is underneath the massive flight deck that I was describing, you have a, a wide open bay that's covered in 
this uh, insulation that's shiny, it makes you look like a spaceship. So in addition to looking cool on the outside, we look very cool on the inside as well. That's actually for fire protection to give us additional time to make sure that we can put a fire out in the event that it occurs. Uh, but inside there, we can store a variety of equipment. As I mentioned, mine warfare emission package is what we're focusing on. There's also a surface warfare emission package. But also in the future, we could implement a wide variety of technology into the ship. It's very adaptable, it's modular. I guess I should probably start, start back a little bit with that uh, before I get into the mine warfare specifics. But what are some of the claims to fame of our ship? We are made of aluminum, so we're lightweight. Uh, that does take away a little bit of the, the armament capabilities you can imagine. But the good news is we're fast. So with that lightweight, we're shallow draft. We have about half the draft of a destroyer, so we can go into places where they can. We're very fast, so we have about 10 knots. Instead of a destroyer, maybe 30 plus knots, we go 40 plus knots. And uh, we have a, in order to enable that speed, besides the lightweight aspect that we have, we have a hydrodynamic design with three holes. So we have a tri-hole design. Uh, we call our main hull, the inner hull, and then the, the two outers are Amas, uh, going after an outrigger canoe design. The ship was designed and built in, well, the, built in America, I'm sorry, but the design was originally a high-speed ferry design from Australia. Uh, the, many aspects of the ship is an international, an international collaboration, for sure. Uh, we use water jet propulsion. The water jets allow us to go fast as part of that concept. It also really improves our maneuverability. Uh, we also, um, yeah, okay. I think that's, that's most of it, but then the, the other piece is the modularity. So we have a very large flight deck, we have a very large mission bay, and so we can quickly and uh, uh, adaptively change what we have to accomplish a variety of missions. So as far as your imagination can take you, this ship can do it for you. Uh, whether it be intelligence collection, uh, whether it be uh, uh, commercially available or uh, say something available through the Marine Corps or the Army, some kind of weapon system, we can more easily integrate into our ship than most ships of this, this size. So the mission bay in the upper left-hand corner is where we would keep these vehicles that we've been operating, but we've also uh, paired with special warfare, explosive ordnance disposal, being able to operate their equipment and their craft out of the same mission bay. Uh, there's a large twin boom extensible crane that if you look in the lower left corner, you can see in the upper part of that picture, the, the crane extends out the back of the ship uh, after opening uh, through our, uh, our stern door there. And what you're seeing in the left, lower left-hand corner is one of the unmanned surface vehicles. These can be outfitted with sweeping gear or hunting gear. Uh, that then lowers into the water and it, it uh, heads out on its mission and it's controlled from inside of our ship by a uh, mineman again, like uh, Chief Rojas. Uh, they operate inside of the ship, they're looking at radar imagery, they're looking at the camera, and they're able to steer it through its mission. The upper right corner, that's a picture of the, the vessel coming in for recovery. So it, has, it takes a little bit of skill. There's actually a sailor who operates a joystick. It's a good thing that we're getting into video games now, because that, <laughs> it's kind of looking in reverse. You're looking at, you're looking at a mirror image and you're trying to control the vehicle, and it has to hook a little line that's dragging in the water just on the forward part of that bow of the yellow uh, device that's in the water. Once it's hooked, we recover it, we get it back on deck, and then we can replenish it, we can get off mission data, do post-mission analysis to try to determine the next step in the problem. Now in the, the lower right corner, we see the other part of the mission package, which is our air -hole. So part of the mine warfare mission package, we work with an MH-60 Sierra aircraft, and it has the ability to neutralize mines using a airborne mine neutralization system. It also can detect mines that are shallow in the water using a laser system. We also operate traditionally on a deployment. We'll have one of those aircraft and we'll have one unmanned aerial vest, uh, vehicle called the MQA Charlie now variant fire scout. That is used for long range surveillance, building our recognized maritime picture. It has radar capabilities as well as a system called AIS which is kind of a who's who system that commercial traffic is using on a regular basis. But by looking at the AIS, what they're presenting themselves to be on their AIS system, and then comparing that to what we see on radar, it can help us deduce which contacts or targets that we're tracking might be of more interest and are worthy of taking a closer look at with our aircraft and help build up that broader picture. Here's some more uh, pictures of the mission bay. So that's the vehicle getting ready to extend out the back and launch. 
there's a picture in the lower left of the vehicle operating out of sea, uh, one of it uh, getting moved around inside of the massive mission bay. The yellow thing you see in the center picture there, it's called a Moe Pond. It's another Australia design. It's a container mover, but it can be adapted on palletized weapon systems as well to move those around the mission bay. And it's quite a, a dance because when the ship is fully outfitted, it, the mission bay, even though it's a large area, is completely packed. So for us to get from one mission to another, it can take four to six hours sometimes to reconfigure just moving things around. And you're talking about some very tight clearances, enough to, to, to kind of give me uh, the, the three pairs I have left to turn greater. But Chief is very confident, his team is well trained, and uh, they're able to uh, do some amazing work. The lower right corner is a picture of the unmanned aircraft that I described. So just taking a step back to the larger Navy for a few minutes to kind of close out uh, for questions and answers. This is dated from February. Um, I did this uh, presentation in my hometown of Tucson for a Navy week initially, and that's when I pulled the data. But the, the general flow is the same. We have the Navy spread out across the globe ready to answer the call at any time. Uh, just recently, we talked about events that are going on. And uh, you know the, the rumor is once, once in, a major global event is occurring. One of the first questions that the president will ask is where are the carriers? And uh, as we've seen in the news recently, uh, we're repositioning assets right now in order to be uh, prepared to best support operations that are occurring globally. Uh, we spend a lot of our time while we're on deployment working with uh, foreign navies. Some of that is building up partnerships and, and uh, allies. Some of it is uh, co competing with uh, near peers and trying to make sure that we uh, maintain a, a posture that effectively allows us to respond and also to maintain the status quo so we conduct freedom of navigation type of operations to challenge excessive maritime claims or also uh, airspace claims. One of the uh, strongest and most deterred uh, part of our uh, Navy is our submarine force. Uh, they're incredible. So we both have a deterrence in the form of having a part of the nuclear triad with aircraft, land-based uh, missiles, as well as the other sea missiles launched from submarines. And then our uh, submarine attack boats are also incredibly uh, useful in the current operations that we do. And in a contingency, they're going to be the ones that you definitely want to be on their side. As I said, a big part of what we're talking about right now, uh, we are not the Navy that has the most ships in the world. And we have to accept that, and we have to adapt to that uh, reality. And allies and partners are a huge part of that. So when you see a ship that's doing a visit in a port that you've never heard about, and you think the sailors are just out there having a good time like they are here in Cincinnati, some of that is true. Uh, but also the, uh, the relationships that we're building as part of those is crucial to our design of our military. And it's not easy. Uh, in fact, during that same underway I talked about, I got a chance to work with the Marine Corps. Uh, we also did a passing exercise with some Japanese ships that were conducting a home port, or sorry, a port visit in our home port in San Diego. Uh, simple event, just establishing some communications and working with them with our helicopter and steering around with each other. But that is critical because you don't want to be learning how to do that when it's when it's you're already into uh, hostile type actions. You want to be doing that in peacetime so that when we have to work together in some kind of contingency, we already have that relationship and those procedures and techniques all established. A big part of why we're here, uh, we're getting funded through the Navy Outreach Program. So we are not, we are not recruiters. However, we are always looking to, to have uh, shipmates join us. So if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to ask, especially the sailors here, uh, any of our experiences, but we're always looking for our shipmates out there and uh, trying to retain the, the, the quality sailors that we have. So I talked about surface warfare. Um, going back through kind of the weapon systems on our ship, uh, we have a, a large gun on the bow. Uh, this is not a picture of it, <laughs> but another class of ship. Uh, so we have a 57 millimeter gun on the front. Uh, after that, we do have a vertical launch uh, module installed. We don't have any missiles currently installed in that. Uh, we are deployed right now on a different independence variant with total combat ship, the Gabriel Giffords. They do have a Hellfire Longbow missile available in that vertical launch uh, system there. After that, I'm not pictured on Cincinnati yet, but we're scheduled to get that as part of the maintenance period in January, is a long-range anti-ship cruise missile. 
uh, called the Naval Strike Missile that we'll be installing on the forward part of the bow there. And that's a containerized weapon system that is uh, currently the longest range anti-ship cruise missile that surface launched in the Navy. Uh, we also have air defense. So we have the Sea Ram uh, air defense system that uh, would help us with point defense. So we're not set up to do large scale air defense like you would with a destroyer. They can defend the carrier and they can set up geometry to be advantageous. We're designed to defend ourselves and if something was very close to us and the geometry were, were helpful, we, could, uh, we can defend them as well. Uh, also in the surface warfare mission package, uh, another piece that we do not have installed but we could if we were uh, so designed or so uh, designated to do so is uh, two 30 millimeter cannons up high on the sea ram deck there uh, that can be also controlled internally from our mission module space. Undersea warfare, again, talk about the submarines that we have. The submarines that we have also play a key role in anti-submarine warfare as well as surface ships. But submarines do present a uh, significant threat in a wartime environment. Air warfare, I talked about our capabilities in air warfare, but uh, here, you know, picture an aircraft carrier in the United States Navy, typically when it's out on deployment and fully loaded with a aviation detachment or aviation wing, we're talking about uh, one of, usually around the 13th largest air force in the world. Each one of those carriers has one. Uh, special warfare, uh, everybody's heard about the Navy SEALs, uh, variety of missions that they can accomplish, most of them we can't talk about in this room, and uh, we can also integrate with those using our mission bay and some of the capabilities that we have. Uh, again, we build up those, those capabilities and we practice those on a regular basis so that if we do need them, we're not learning how to integrate with special warfare when we need it, we're already ready to go. As well as explosive ordnance disposal, which can come into play. Uh, we can also use explosive ordnance disposal to help neutralize mines, so that overlaps with our mine warfare mission. And we're able to uh, use them as well. They can collect those mines if we were trying to get some intelligence off of them, uh, rather than just uh, destroying them. <laughs> Information warfare is uh, it's hard to overstate how important that is in modern warfare. And uh, we spend a lot of our time training on it. We spend a lot of our time trying to make sure that our networks are hardened and ready to um, withstand a cyber attack. Not my biggest area of expertise, but I know enough to know how important it is. So, in the end, the Navy mission continues, and uh, your sailors on your ship are working hard every day to uh, represent the city well, and we're grateful to have your support. Uh, this time, I'll open up for any questions. So 
everyone pretty much can have lines. They're very cheap, so it's one of those, a dictator who's trying to gain an asymmetric advantage can get lines and get them cheaply and get a lot of them. So they're widely proliferated. They are different though. There's, there's simple lines, there's more complicated lines that cost more money and involve higher technology that can be more discriminant about the targets that it will choose. Um, but they are uh, uh, widely proliferated, I would say. Now, uh, as far as putting them in the water, uh, I don't think that that's something that's widely being utilized uh, during conflicts, it is. But there, it's not something that a lot of navies are just putting in haphazardly during peacetime operations. So where you're gonna see the mines in the water traditionally are during the conflicts. Um, and then when they're being utilized, sorry, the third part of the question was? Uh, where are they? <laughs> okay, how do they put them out? So, the, the thing about mind warfare is it's a, it's a game of statistics and probabilities. Not only with how you design your minefield, but how you get rid of your minefield and move on afterwards. Uh, to some point, you, you, if you're designing a minefield, you don't want to put them in a perfectly grid pattern. Because then once you find a couple, you could just extend that and, and find them all, hopefully. So there is a random aspect to the mines. The mines are only able to be effective in certain depths of water. So depending on how the explosive is and whether the mine detects something and rises up to meet the, the contact or if it just detonates in place, really uh, whittles down the area of water where they can be utilized. So you can, once you have a little bit of intelligence, we're talking about do we know who has what types of mines and you're able to get that information to the planners, they can throw out about 90% of the water uh, around the area that you're concerned about. And then you just have to uh, basically draw a big line around the rest of it and say, well, they could be here, and then you start applying more intelligence, more assessment to try to whittle it down to an area that you can start applying mind warfare and effort, like what the independence variant the Coral Combat Ship can do. But then you apply a bunch of effort in the area that you think the mines are, and then at some point you get to the point where you say, well, that seems good enough, we think we've got enough mines to make it safe enough to, continue to start to use that, that water again. It's a, uh, unfortunately, you can never get to that full confidence that you've cleared up lines. <laughs> and certainly. In the past, we've been able to uh, do ride-alongs with. <laughs> 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 County Sheriff and Air Force General, let's go along with the KC-195 off flight and see the plane at Rickenbacker. Plus, a couple of us were lucky to go on aircraft carriers out of San Diego uh, a couple years ago. I wonder if there's any chance that we could do it with the U.S. The Cincinnati namesake ship. Great question, sir. So I'll, I'll answer this in a few ways. One, I'm, I'm going to interface through Barry for this one. Oh, sorry, Barry and Jim. But uh, but what I would say is we are about to do a uh, we call it friends and family day cruise, and of course you are all family. Uh, the only piece is I'll offer. There is a limited number of spaces I can have. We are limited by the amount of life rafts, and because we are a small crew, I can fit about 216 people total, including the crew. So I will definitely be talking to Jim and, and the team at the USS Cincinnati Foundation, and I, I'm going to offer up a, a certain number of spots. Once I get back to San Diego, I need to check and see how many of the crew members are planning to bring friends and family, uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll be able to block off a certain number of spots, and it would be amazing to have folks from Cincinnati there. What's the next step for us? And the, <laughs>
Sailors love to show off the ship, so if you are in the area, please do work through the foundation. Uh, the only challenging piece is base access, so a little bit of heads up is, is probably what would be needed so we can try to figure out how to get you on if you don't have uh, base access already. <coughs> and, sir? Yeah, I have, I have a feeling. Uh, the one for good Cincinnati ship we have here, is that good to protect us here in, in Ohio? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's here now, so is it one of those ships that protects us? Uh, the Cincinnati, you So the, the USS Cincinnati, Cincinnati, the float? Right. I think the float is doing a good job. <laughs> <laughs> as far as, I mean, our, I mean, uh, it's hard to answer that question. We, we, we did not, well, we did not come here on the ship, so the ship is still in San Diego. We flew in here, okay. so we're not able to directly. But the missions that we do, I would argue, do help protect the uh, folks. Okay. Now, the reason for that particular question is everybody in the room knows what happened a week ago when the intelligence did not pick up on what took place in this room. And our intelligence didn't pick up on it, and neither did they intelligence to pick up on it. Are we supposed to have that? That's why I raised that question. Yeah, and I'm, unfortunately, I'm not I'm not familiar with the intelligence or what was available for what happened in Israel, so I'm not able to get into that one. Um, but I, I will say, from working with intelligence, it's not always perfect. But I'm not able to give any specifics on that. Oh, sorry, man. Yes. How many ships are like the one? Uh, the, the uh, so they're, they're, I believe we're going to settle with around uh, 19. We've, we have decommissioned the first couple because they, and I was on one of them, number four. There are prototypes and the amount of differences on those ships by the time you get to the, the ones with the, the larger hull numbers like ours at 20. There's so many differences that it was impractical to up, update them. Um, and so it was actually uh, more effective to decom them a little bit early. But we are still building a few. I've been trying. <laughs> I can go this side just <laughs> That is true. As far as number of ships, uh, China. China has more ships than us. I'm sorry, one over here, sir. Yeah, with uh, the, the Cincinnati being part of the Pacific Fleet. And I mean, things seem to be ramping up in the Western Pacific as well. What role and mission would you expect the Cincinnati, especially after its super maintenance upgrade period, to partake should that heat up in the Western Pacific? So Cincinnati, what I'd expect, uh, we are a mine, mine warfare mission package. However, we are a multi-mission ship. So one of the things that we've been talking about is integrating with the Marine Corps. Um, and if you, uh, if you read articles, if you're seeing modern articles about uh, some of the contingencies that we would expect, uh, there's a desire to be mobile and have uh, the ability to move quickly, which our ship can do, and move things, replenish, and uh, work with the, the concept of expeditionary advanced basing. So I'd expect that, that we will continue to do independent operations or mobile operations where we're able to work in a variety of applications there. Uh, there's also the possibility that we could partner with strike groups and become a part of those, but uh, that's not our traditional role, and that's not what we spend a lot of our time working in. Along that same line, because it's a, a jet propulsion, like, like the world's biggest jet ski, um, and it's very low draft, does, does the Cincinnati do upriver missions like a PT boat used to? Uh, I have not seen any missions so far to be applied for that. We're still operating near the water, but not going up river. I have been up a river uh, about eight hours, going through the Columbus and uh, Willamette, Columbia and Willamette River off of Portland to go into a maintenance period on one of my former patrol combat ships. But uh, that you know, it was it was a it was a smooth experience. It was very capable of doing that. Um, so it, it, it's not to say that it couldn't happen, but right now we're not really trading for that. Good question. So how did your vessel come to be named after our wonderful city? Well, it's the it's the fifth such uh, vessel to be named after the city, so it's in that tradition. As far as the specifics of how this was re-upped, I don't know, Jim might be able to answer that a little bit better. Honestly, I'm not sure. So Congress makes those decisions, and they're working together with the Department of the Navy to, to name our, our ships, and they take various uh, things into consideration. One of the greatest advantages we have is that Cincinnati has been, from its inception, a maritime city. 
Um, if we, Cincinnati was created, we, we couldn't park position on the Ohio River, and we've been a maritime city ever since. Maybe someone in the middle. <laughs> Sorry, Pat. You can shift the gears a little bit. You, you talked about how uncommon the foundation is. In addition, you, you describe how many other ones are there or are around? Oh, how many other uh, foundations? Yeah. Well, each, each ship is going to have a commissioning committee, and out of that, a uh, ship sponsor, and then the, the foundation may or may not endure. Again, this might be a better question for Jim as well. Sorry, I'm a friend. But, but the relationship is absolutely unique. Um, as far as every ship kind of has some support from their namesake, for sure, like in uh, Coronado, we uh, sent our Sailor of the Year each year to be a part of a Fourth of July parade. And so there's always been some interactions, but just when I say the amount and level of interaction that we enjoy here is definitely unique. But as far as how many Navy foundations there are? Um, one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.